uh, meeting on families and well-being policy for the committee. And um, I've only had one apology in France, and that's from Calvary, from Crown Crown for Health Watch. Um, no other apologies in anybody else yet? Some of them obviously are, but some of them come directly into the department, or some providers may 
have a certain place in, but we weren't given clear indication of how this is the norm, and that's what we wanted to do. Are we happy now? All right, um, next item on the agenda item five is the all age disability. Yeah, sorry. So, yeah. Um,
in terms of the timetable, apologies that it is changing, but it's really important that it's changing because it's changing on the back of co production and consultation. Uh, no, no, this, this strategy is part of a suite of documents that are going into conference in January. It's been to Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, at Health and Wellbeing Board, um, uh, we had a discussion about those key changes and took some more feedback from Health and Wellbeing Board. So, the really good news is if you have comments and views about this strategy and areas uh, it should be uh, in there, then it is an opportunity to feed that in. It's not too late to change the strategy because it's changing. Okay, thanks. Anybody want to ask? Yes, Trina and then Thanks, Wayne. Sorry, I didn't have a mic, but I'm sure that everyone can hear me. Um, it's a fantastic report. Um, well done, and um, everybody putting this together. Um, it's more like a, a code of good working practice, though, isn't it? And a working document still, um, because there's little data on how the, these priorities are going to be delivered. Um, but I also just ask you a little bit on the All Age Disability Partnership Board and who is on that, and how is that? Um, going to moving forward. Okay. Uh, first of all, just to say, there is an emerging plan. So, like, like all of our council uh, pledges, uh, the idea is that the plans, the delivery plans uh, for, for those uh, pledges for work are being developed at least. So, there isn't quite a lot of detail. If you like the strategic document to give the hooks for those more detailed plans to hand in the why don't I have to have my being board with this? Are to the autism strategy, and the autism strategy is quite detailed, and it talks about diagnoses and a whole range of things. So the idea is that there are a number of pillars that sit under these broad strategies that deliver them in, in, in detail. Um, the Disability Partnership Board is uh, is made up from a number of organisations. I haven't got the, the, the membership with me uh, now, but I know that there's been a review of the membership. Uh, in order to make sure that it's going to be fit for purpose for delivering this plan. Previously, it was it was focused on social care. So the old disability board was very focused on social care. And was quite effective in things like uh, looking at learning disability services and personal interborn view work, mm -hmm. but wasn't broad in terms of looking at employment and uh, further education and those types of things. So uh, the idea is that the board will be reconstituted uh, with, with a much broader membership so they can look after the um, implementation of this strategy. Okay, thank you. Jeanette, and then Alan. Thank you, Chair. And just to agree with uh, Trina, I think it's a fantastic document. It's very aspirational. We're proud that we're on council's aspirations are to care for um, all age disability. Um, I've got a few issues, I've just got all aspirations really. Um, I'm really pleased that um, hate crime is in here. I, I was, I, I, we've all seen reports for a while now about individual cases, which, which seem to stem from the, the toxic discourse around disability and welfare and surrounding, which is just heartbreaking and really worrying. So, um, have you got any statistics of uh, levels of hate crime to say to people, um, maybe over the last year, how they got and how we can approach that? And then, just secondly, it was that it was. You know, economic and employment are being a fantastic aspiration for anyone, but especially disabled people. I've got a, a, a bit of concern about um, benefits at the moment for kids replacing DLA, and that's got massive problems associated with that, and it's pushing people into quite a bit of hardship because there's only way for to, to save money and to make it put in there, reducing incomes quite considerably to a large stroke of disabled people. So, has that been factored in all? That'd be something that we've been monitoring lately. Number of really tricky areas in that. I think the whole issue of welfare benefits and employment is a, is a really tricky area, and I, I focus here very much on the aspirational elements. Uh, obviously, in terms of the, the camp, uh, in terms of the real pledges, then uh, you know, we, we do need to look at the whole spectrum of how how um, farms work and pensions work with people across the board as well. Uh, there's a very strong link clearly between poverty and health. So, so that's something that's very important to all in terms of uh, how we work across organisations. Um, so economic wellbeing is, is, is a key part of this, and that's why we've grouped the number of um, areas underneath that kind of economic wellbeing, which is, which is, which is very important. Um, 
Just, uh, just in relation to the hate crime, uh, uh, Mark, etc. Um, safeguarding is something that does fall under the remit of this board, and uh, we could clearly cover that under the, um, the, the as a sort of specific item for board rather than trying to sort of um, throw some, some figures in here. Um, but uh, there, there is a specific piece of work um, under the uh, people with disabilities are safe in their communities. Um, and uh, the key areas of work there are on, uh, making safeguarding personal, which is a specific piece of work to ensure that the outcomes of safeguarding processes are in line with people's long-term aspirations. And then there's a the whole barrack hate crime and antisocial behaviour work as well that's very strong with that. But I would suggest that if you wanted to focus in that as a scrutiny board and bring some specific yeah. elements in.
The other big factor in that is the CCG contracts with a uh, provider, uh, uh, Cheshire Rural Partnership Trust, to provide a whole range of services for, for people with disabilities, particularly learning disabilities. And um, we don't contribute to that contract, but actually we have social workers, again, that are doing very similar sorts of things. So again, if we pool our resources and our views together in terms of what that contract should look like into one optimized <coughs> approach, then we, we can get much better results for the people. But all and that's, that's what that integrated commission is about, is to improve the outcomes by pooling resources together and move away from almost a competitive approach that, that's in there at the moment. Very good comment. And just say, um, what Graham describes in terms of doing commissioning obviously extends throughout the whole life of the child, young person, adult, and that's a more integrated approach we're moving towards. And this, this strategy provides the framework for us to do that. I think, specifically for a minute in respect of children, there were some very radical changes introduced as part of the Children and Families Act um, in September 2014. And that actually saw um, statements of special educational needs moving to become education, health and care plans. And I, I often think this as statement is a statement of fact, that child has that disability that's almost a piece of paper as a statement. Whereas an education, health and care plan is locking partners together in a team around a youngster and their family. And it's very much, the shift has been away from the services that you put in and how you support on a day-to-day basis and the statement entitles you to X, Y, Z services and it's this plan which is set up to enable children to achieve their goals. So the, the legislation very much enshrines that, that children should achieve their aspirations in the same way that children without special educational needs or disabilities should have and could. And what we've got locally is um, health partners through the CCG locking very much into how, on a micro level, children's plans are developing, but how that now is being extrapolated to a much broader strategy so that we jointly commission based on what individual children's needs aggregated up and telling us about how services should be shaped moving forward.
happens within the strategy where it talks about emotional well-being. Um, so often I think physical health is spoken about and, and mental health is, is forgotten about. So I just kind of want to make a bit of a plea really around parity and seeing that the mental health and making sure that that is, is recognised.
Um, there must be a way forward. I know that you have been there <coughs> and, you, and there was a, a task and finish group that was set up to look at it. I'm told that the results of that were um, very loosely, um, very loosely um, translated and various people put their own um, interpretation on what should be done and what shouldn't be done. It seems to me that the situation has deteriorated. Can something be done so that um, Grill Evolutions and, and, the, and the fundraisers can work together for the benefit of, this, of these service users? Yeah, okay. Uh, I've been closely involved in this. Uh, fundraising and the charities that run uh, against each of the data are really important. Uh, working with, with those people, uh, they do actually bring in many thousands of pounds worth of additional money into rural solutions for the benefit of, of the people who use those services. So very, very important that there's uh, proper relationships in place. Um, as uh, was suggested, I uh, met with the, uh, the heads of the charities and World Evolutions and uh, they did a piece of work with our audit team in terms of having a safe but very clear process in terms of cash handling and uh, the key issue then wasn't to do with handling cash the key issue was that staff time which was paid for by the public in terms of their council tax was being used to raise funds so it was a really a very important issue about when staff were on their own time they could do charitable work, but they couldn't do charitable work in paid time. They were being employed by the organisation in that paid time. So it was a very important part of it. Now I know some of the people involved in the charities weren't very happy with that. Uh, they also, uh, there was some unhappiness about having a very formal process about the receipt of monies and all of those sorts of things. So we had a scenario where staff were collecting in a fiver here and a fiver there carrying it down and then made it. So, so what we wanted for the protection of the staff and the protection of the charities was a really clear process. Those processes are in place and as far as I'm aware, all of the charities are fundraising and are able to use them, but it's in a different way in terms of the process and it's a much safer process. The organisation couldn't go ahead with the, uh, the very informed processes that were in place and the risk that staff were under um, they were, for example, collecting money from individual users and their receipts were, were being issued and those types of things. So it was very important that we clarified this and got it right to but it wasn't important in the report. But, but absolutely, I want to reassure the committee, we are very much in support of the charities and the work that they do and their relation with Rural Evolutions. Not, not with that, but with Rural Evolutions uh, will be cemented and it's cemented as, as far as I'm aware. Because as I said, I did meet with all of those key people and uh, they, they weren't very happy as it, uh, in terms of the process. There may be one or two people involved that still are happy, I don't know, but I haven't been anywhere about this. Okay, and David, and then Alan. Thank you, Alan. Yes, probably an easy one uh, for you, Graham, really. It's with regards to the sort of parental relationship between a public sector body and a uh, private sector organisation. You've obviously got a, a plan that will hopefully break even within three years. When anything doesn't, what is the relationship with the council and that private entity then? Okay, so this is it. The council is a 100% shareholder in World Evolutions. Um, there is a facility for the council to loan the company. Uh, for overspend. So during this three year period, there is a facility uh, in, in terms of that. Uh, the council could take the service back in house at some point in the future. I know some local authorities have done that where things haven't worked out in the way that was expected. We don't expect that to happen, and uh, that isn't something that uh, is, is part of the plan at this stage, but it is something. Just bear in mind, whilst it is a company formally constituted, uh, the council is looking for some shares. Sorry, so, so where does your oversight start and end? Right. On that one? Because it kept, I'm conscious that you don't want it to be some bottomless pit of money that keeps, that keeps on being drained from the council. Okay. So what the company has is a contract with adult social care. 
So that's its core contract. So the business model at this point in time is built solely on that core contract with adult social care. And there's some projections in terms of additional business that they're able to get. Now the company itself will be chasing that additional business. It isn't, it isn't something that uh, will be um, taken forward from an adult social care perspective. We're, what we'll be focused on is the quality and the consistency of our contract. Um, the leader of the council is uh, on the board in terms of the company board. Uh, I'm working through that. And then what we've got is a shareholder scrutiny group. It's not a scrutiny in the sense of the policy and performance committee, but we've got an officer scrutiny group that's keeping an eye on the performance of the company and, <coughs> uh, if you like, uh, how it operates over, over that period of time. Particularly keeping an eye on the financials and any potential risk. Okay, um, Alan, you may be visited. Alan Walter Cherry Jeunesse. <coughs> yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I share those concerns about the, the, the viability of the, this operation. And in some ways, the council is, is never overly generous in setting up these companies. Um, in lending it money, it's got a cash flow problem, but actually, if it, it was still part of the council, you would have paid it out anyway. So, but now we pay it out and we get interest back on it uh, in the process. It, it, you won't let them use alternative services. Um, they've got to continue to use the council services. I mean, I understand why they're doing that, but it does it does load the company down. And even when uh, it's been sort of partly suggested, maybe you could guarantee some of the pension costs, and then you say, oh no, you can't do that because that will make the company. <laughs> um, we give them a competitive advantage, so they can't have that. Um, the only one that I could see where maybe, and I wasn't sure whether I read it right, there's a startup cost of a quarter of a million. And I wasn't sure, is the company going to have to cover that? Is that going to be part of the cost? Or are you taking that as a hit this year in, in that sort of service? I wasn't entirely um, sure about that. And, and they're, they're landed with quite, you know, we, we struggle to make £500,000 of savings, so that, that they've now got to do this. Um, and going forward, we're sort of saying, well, we think the demand will go by 1.2 million, but actually we'll be working really hard to try and prevent that if we possibly can. Um, my, my question out of all that is, uh, we've kind of, we've, well not kind of, the contract gives uh, specific amounts that they will receive over the next three years. How does that, what, what I was uncertain of was, um, with personal budgets that individuals have, how can we as a council be certain that some of the individuals will actually utilise the services, these services, and won't want to spend that money in another area? Thanks for that, Alan. It really does highlight why this has been a really tricky exercise to, to undertake because uh, it, it is actually really complicated. And one of the hardest things in uh, extricating uh, parts of the council out is that most of the back, back office support is part of someone as opposed to a whole person. So you know, if you were, if you then don't provide that back office support to that organisation, um, then you have to find additional money to pay for it. So that's really tricky in itself. So the company has got some uh, obligations for the next three years in terms of buyback of that type of support. Um, that meant that really what we need to do to do is give surety in terms of what we what we would expect to contract over the next three years. Now that's based on our projections, which includes um, those people that we would expect to go to the company's new business. Now they're just a proportion of those people that come to us. So every year we get a whole number of uh, new people that come through, primarily through children's services, through transition. And a proportion of those each year are expected to take up day services. So we project that forward in terms of what's happened in recent years, what's happened this year, and then project that forward to give us that percentage. So um, I think the advantages that the company have are in having a steady state contract for three years, whilst they grow the business. Not many companies get that opportunity. There are some disadvantages in terms of having to buy back, but don't forget that the buy back is included in the contract value, so in the future that can shrink. Um, what the company had to carry forward is uh, a saving which um, was taken out of the budget 
Uh, we, we plan to take a say in that, and, and that's £500,000. So the company now has time to deliver that saving, rather than all being delivered in one year. And then the final bit, the 250k startup costs. Yes, they've been borne by all social care so far, but we are expecting to get some refunds from our council transformation fund for that. So, you know, yes, at this point in time, it's been through there. Um, Walter. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, more just straightforward uh, question. The, um, the buildings, the centres, are, are they leased? Is it a public home rent or is it a commercial rent? At least at a reasonable rent. It's more than a pack of rent and less than a full commercial rent. But the building is still on to us. Yes. Thank you. Um, Cherry. Yes. Yes, the, the business model, this, this is why the business model is interesting. The business model will allow the, the company to take business from other areas. Uh, if people choose to come into this area, um, from Cheshire West for example, uh, Cheshire West could fund them to access the pollution services or they fund themselves. Um, there's certainly, uh, we, we've traditionally had people from Liverpool come into our, our services. And uh, when we fully reviewed everyone a couple of years ago, we found that a number of people who had found their way into, into, uh, into our services and weren't charging them for it. But it's, you know, there is certainly people who choose to, to come over to Wirral, uh, A, because it's a nice place, but also because some of those services, like Hoyden Park, uh, like some of the work at Peswell, uh, is, is seen as being uh, really positive stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, people do choose those services. Yes. Um, thank you. Well, I'd just, I'd just like to congratulate um, all our work this one. I'm still amazed, you know, we've been faced with um, um, the initial funding for the central government's growth, you know, a dire situation in many ways. And I think this is, a, it is much preferable to just hide than hide much space out to the private sector. This is a social enterprise. And I really do want to congratulate you all the work that's gone into this. Just, just, uh, there's a point of opportunities there. We've seen the best fights, I believe, the case was second to I'll have to try it. Um, and also, I'm pleased to see the two gear agents in place. I'd just like an assurance that that's not going to end uh, before people stop working. Because sometimes I have heard about people two years over and then after a few months that comes to an end. Um, and also to be losing yourself. In terms of the current their uh, workforce, their uh, terms and conditions are protected and their pensions are protected. Um, new people that come into the service won't come in on the same terms and conditions. But the current workforce are protected and they're protected going forward as well. Chair. Um, Chair. Um, Chair. Um, Chair. Did you use any sign for some of So we've lost staff previously, but we haven't lost staff as part of the transfer. So, the efficiencies, the one and a half million pounds efficiencies, a lot of that did come from reduced staffing. Um, but uh, that, that will happen last year and uh, uh, at the end of last this year. But the transfer arrangements is all of those staff that were working for the company yesterday, working for me yesterday, working for the company today. Thank you, Wendy. And then, yeah. Thank you. Um, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you 